and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissin. And this is the show for you if you're bored of people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our fantastic guest this week didn't want to be introduced as an expert, but we think she'll be absolutely fascinating to talk to. She's the campaign manager of the Taxpayers Alliance. Chloe Wesley, welcome to Trigonometry. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And before we get on with the show, just tell us a little bit about who you are, how did you get to where you are, and maybe a little bit about kind of your thoughts and your background, how you developed your ideas and your views. Sure. Well, um, I'm from Australia originally. Um, as people find out when they see me on TV, they're like, what's that accent? <laughs> um, I'm from Brisbane in Queensland. Uh, I didn't grow up wanting to be a campaign manager for a tax organization. That wasn't really part of the plan. I was just very, very interested from poli in politics from a very young age. I was a complete nerd at school. I remember actually being picked on a little bit for being a bit obsessed with politics because I was always reading newspapers and watching political shows. It was quite an odd obsession that I had. Um, and I, my parents were like, where does this come from? Um, and so it was just a, a natural thing that I was really interested in. And so as I was, I was reading um, as a young person, developing my thoughts, I was very open to lots of different ideas. But um, when I was about 16, I think I was a little bit more left-wing than I am now. So I thought you know, the world was really unfair. There were some people that were struggling and others that were doing really well. And I, I was very skeptical of authority and of, of the system. And I read a lot of you know, French and German philosophy. Um, and I read this book by Albert Camus called The Rebel, where he writes about revolutions and um, he wrote about the Soviet Union and it changed a lot of my thinking about things because he pointed out the flaws in, in his thinking and that he was a left-wing person who wanted to empower people. But he saw that when you do have socialist and communist regimes, actually people can become enslaved. You just give power, you just transfer power to a state. Um, and actually that's a different kind of enslavement. So it made me very skeptical of um, statist ideologies and actually I became a lot more fond of the idea of individualism that people societies where people are free and they have the most freedom to choose things are far more prosperous and, and people thrive a lot more than in societies where there is a really big state um, so those, those that's kind of how my views developed but I, I moved to London to study philosophy uh, just after high school so when I was about 18 and I really got to engage with a lot of these ideas on a deeper level and I met some incredible philosophers. I was very lucky I went to a philosophy college. So we had you know, 12 different professors and experts in all different kinds of areas. Um, and I, I did read a, a lot of Marx, I was fascinated. Um, I think he identified a problem but proposed the completely wrong solution in my opinion. Uh, I fell in love with Aristotle, uh, Greek philosophy, um, and I just, I, I really loved ideas and I, I became very interested in British politics over here because everyone was talking about this and everyone was talking about you know, the European Union and that was, you know, from a very early time when I moved here, I remember that was already part of the national conversation, at least in you know, the common room and, and students talking about these things. Um, and I didn't really set out to get into politics over here um, in my uh, at the end of my second year of university, I volunteered for an MP um, to help him get elected um, on the conservative side. And then completely unexpectedly, while I was still a student, um, he offered me a job. And that was life changing because instead of just reading about politics and debating it online and watching Question Time and shouting at the TV, <laughs> um, I was I was actually I got to be part of it. I got to work in Parliament and it was incredible. And I felt very, very lucky. Um, and also a little bit surprised that, you know, from growing up in Queensland to working in the British Parliament, it, it wasn't really an obvious um, thing for me to turn out to do. So that was incredible and I feel very lucky to have that experience. And e even working in Parliament, I was still reading and, and studying um, and learning more about the EU and I became very severely Eurosceptic. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to work for this MP was because he was very Eurosceptic at the time. 
um, because it was my scepticism of, of you know centralized control of taking control away from the individual and every the more I read about the EU the more I thought hang on this is a really really bad thing for this country and even though this wasn't the country I'm born in this is a country where I have family and history and this you know I just felt like the country was moving in the wrong direction so I was very passionate about it and um, I got to work on the the leave campaign something that I really really wanted to do and that was incredible. Um, I didn't think we were going to win the referendum uh, but I thought we'd come pretty close and I wanted to stake a claim in that fight. If there was going to be this referendum in Britain at a time when I was living here I wanted to have it known that I was on the side of the, the anti the EU um, side uh, and that was incredible and from there I um, helped launch another Brexit group after the referendum to hold Theresa May to account. Um, Gisela Stewart, uh, Labour MP, she's fantastic, one of my heroes, well an ex-MP now, um, she stood down. Uh, and now I work at the Taxpayers Alliance which is very much in line with my kind of um, scepticism of government and of you know centralised power. Um, I think people are taxed way too much in this country. Um, I think in general there is a move towards you know, more spending, more governments. Whenever there's a problem in society, the first thought of most politicians and most commentators is how can the government solve it? So we've got a problem with, with you know, ch childhood obesity, kids eating too much sugar. How The government must do something. The government must introduce a sugar tax. This is the kind of, um, you know, way of thinking in Westminster at the moment. And the organisation I work for, we're in the minority. We're the group saying, hang on, maybe every problem in society isn't solved by a big government spending money and taxing people. Maybe individuals can make choices. Maybe there are free market solutions to these things. Um, so I've been with the Taxpayers Alliance for about a year and I'm loving it. I'm not loving the criticism <laughs> because it's, it's very brave to go out and argue for lower taxes in the current climate. Really? Um, yeah, I think so. I think I'm... Um, uh, I'm always outnumbered in all the shows that I do. I remember I did any questions and there was uh, two MPs um, and uh, a priest, socialist priest, um, lovely, lovely, lovely chap, um, and they were all talking about the cost of living um, and how the government can solve it. And I said, well, what about taking less money away from people so they have more disposable income? And they all laughed at me. So <laughs> <laughs> It is a it is a non conventional uh, viewpoint at the moment. Well, that's great. We love to have people with non conventional viewpoints on the show. Um, and so, what does the Taxpayers Alliance do? We'll come to the Brexit Brexit in sure. a, in, in a bit. Uh, what do you do at the Taxpayers Alliance? Do you uh, campaign? Do you advocate to government? Do you lobby government to change things? How do you try and make uh, change to society? Well, we try and connect activists to government um, and also speak for taxpayers. So the Taxpayers Alliance was founded in 2004 um, by a couple of guys, Andrew Allen and Matthew Elliott. And at the time, every politician, every political party was calling for higher taxes and more spending. And there was a, a lot of lobbying in Parliament, in Westminster, for more money. So charities would lobby for more money. A different pressure groups. There wasn't really a pressure group or a group representing taxpayers, the people that are paying for all these things. So they set up this group. I think mostly to just put pressure on political parties to think about taxpayers and they write policy actually, um, and just expose how much government spending there is, what it's being spent on, um, and point out some areas where money can be saved. So at the moment, um, we're a pretty small organisation still, but we uh, get a lot of press attention because I think we have a unique viewpoint at the moment in Westminster. And we do a lot. We do reports um, on what the tax system should look like. So in 2012, we released the single income tax, which outlined how we would, re we would simplify taxes, um, what areas of spending we would cut, and what the kind of perfect Britain would look like. Mm. Not a perfect Britain, but where, where the country could go. And it was very practical. It was, you know, government spending should be about a third of GDP, and taxes on income should be about 33% and figured out you know all the numbers and all the way that the government could move towards this position. Um, at the moment government spending is uh, about 40% um, and if you're a lower earner you're taxed at about a rate of about 40% and if you're a higher earner the tax rate is 53%. So we've got a long way to go to get to that vision but um, we do a lot of local work so the things that people don't really see the taxpayers do, the taxpayers alliance do um, is all of our local campaigning. So we do national 
press releases and reports and we go on political shows, but the day-to-day -day work, a lot of it is just local activist calls and says, I think my local council is spending money on this thing. Can you help me set up a stand so I can protest it? Or can you tell me the person I can get in touch with to change this? Um, so at the moment we're doing a campaign in Southampton because they want to introduce this new surcharge, this clean air zone surcharge. So if you want to drive into Southampton, you've got to pay £100, which is essentially a tax to visit Southampton. So we're it's not helping. Worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Southampton. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's not. I yeah. wouldn't. I, no, I wouldn't pay a fiver to go there. I'll be honest. Really? <laughs> no. I haven't been before, but Don't. if there was a hundred pound charge, I'd be much less likely to. Yeah. And so that's just one of the campaigns we're doing. We do a lot on council tax, which is one of the most hated taxes in Britain mm. because mm. you have to pay that. Like, you, you, it doesn't just come out of your income straight away. You ha you get a bill and you have to pay it, and that. I mean, people are really ticked off about it. Um, and they really care about how that money is spent. And sometimes it's spent well, but more often than not, we find areas where it's not spent well. Mm. So we do we do a lot of things, um, but yeah. Uh, uh, one of the things, so you, what you're proposing sounds great. My worry is, number one, what happens to our public services? I mean, let's be fair, the NHS isn't, well, it doesn't look like it's doing that well. It needs more money. The roads are in a horrible state in London. They're talking about cutting police services, crime spiking. Don't we need people to pay more tax to pay for these public services? Well, at the moment, government spending is about £30,000 per household. Um, so government spending is very, very high. There's a lot of money in the kitty, and at the, there's billions of pounds being spent in projects and areas that aren't essential services. So about 14 billion in foreign aid, for example, um, about 56 billion put aside for HS2, um, which is a train from Birmingham to London. It's going to make you know this infrastructure project. There's so many areas of spending that you could cut and redivert into public services, which is actually something that we advocate. Um, I think there are areas of spending, areas of public public services that need more money. I think social care is underfunded. I think it was a huge mistake to make it separate to the NHS and then to lump that cost into local council. Social care does need to be funded. Um, I think policing probably needs uh, money to be spent well, and it isn't always spent well, but also they probably need more funding. And when you pay your taxes, the things you think about, it's the NHS, it's bin collection, it's education, policing, defence. And these areas are areas where actually government has cut down on spending. One area the government hasn't cut down on is public sector pensions, which costs about 38 billion a year, more than um, the education budget in, in England. So I understand the argument and that politicians make that we need to put up taxes to pay for public services, but you can't make that argument if you're spending a lot of money in, on things that just don't aren't necessary. State-funded art, it's not necessary. Like, if I was a politician and I had to choose between putting more money into the health system or spending, you know, millions to give to artists to do state-funded drawings that go in galleries that people probably won't visit, because if you can't make money off your art, it's probably not going to be very popular. <laughs> um, yeah, we know all about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but can you imagine a state-funded comedy night? That'd be awful. That'd Goodness. be terrible. Yeah. You'd have to fill out a form and say, I <laughs> adhere to these regulations, <laughs> and, and you, they'd say, actually, no, you can't make that joke. Yeah. And it'd be rubbish. Just like I a normal think. comedy. <laughs> yeah, and that's the way comedy's going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but on public services as well, um, we're doing a lot of work on technology and automation. So how um, technology can actually improve, particularly the NHS. So at the moment, um, NHS servers are using, they're using like Windows 98. Um, <laughs> uh, there's been examples of doctors um, using WhatsApp to share patient records, which isn't just like bad. Or it is encrypted. It's actually, not encrypted, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's, like, it's not the best way of doing things. No. So no. Yeah, there needs to be a lot yeah. of reform in you know, efficiency and that kind of thing. And, and we're doing some research on that. To, but does the AHS really use Windows 98? That's why it was so it's so vulnerable to cyber attacks. You had that WannaCry, yeah. um, was it WannaCry or Wannabe Cry attack last year? Yeah. 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 Windows 98. Wow. Well, this is what I was going to ask you, Chloe. What are, there must be a few examples that if you just tell an ordinary person, this is what the government's doing with your money. They've got to be, you probably have a few of those where you kind of go, this is what they do. And people go, ah, ah, you know, and mm. freak out. What, can you give us a, a few examples of something like that? Well, I think the one that frustrates people the most is pay for public sector staff. Mm. Not frontline staff, mm. not nurses and teachers, uh, bureaucrats, 
civil servants and bosses, um, the amount of money that goes into not just salaries, but also bonuses and payouts for top staff is extraordinary. Um, and because there isn't a lot of scrutiny over it, you just assume that the government spends money well, right? Um, it's only groups at the Taxpayers Alliance that kick up a fuss and say, hang on, why are you giving a local government boss a £300,000 payout? That's twice the salary of the Prime Minister. Something's going wrong here. Um, so that's the one that I think annoys people the most in our research. So we do, every year we do um, a report called the Town Hall Rich List, which is top paid local government <laughs> chief executives in the country. And quite a lot of them are earning more than Theresa May, which is... I that's would... fair, considering <laughs> her, how well she's doing at the moment. Yeah. I deduct her just for that fucking <laughs> dance, right. I thought it was a good dance. Really? No. I think it made her oh, relatable. Okay, that, that's it. We're, that's I'm it. Triggered. I'm triggered. <laughs> that that's where you're done. I, I, that was horrible. I, I, I nearly had a heart attack just watching it. That's really? how unpleasant it was. Yeah. I, you, I, you thought it was good. I can't do better than that. And so I, I liked it, but, <laughs> but it distracted from you know, everything else. So I think it was very smart politics because everyone was talking about her dance. They weren't talking about the fact that she didn't use the word checkers once in her speech. Mm. Um, so it was good politics. There you go. Looking yeah. look competent at something you're not supposed to be doing <laughs> yeah. and then no one cares that you're incompetent in what you are doing. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, okay. Uh, so, so the chief executives get paid mm -hmm. more than Theresa May. Uh, oh, but adds... still, that's that's not some like that's that's definitely going to piss people off. I can yeah. totally see that. But that's not like a thing that makes me go, "Oh my god, I can't believe that's happening." Is there like a thing that we spend tons of money on? The well, I mean, high sp uh, HS two is a big one. Yeah. Going so, to Birmingham, who wants to do I that? I mean, it's it's so unnecessary. It is the wrong infrastructure project. I'm not against infrastructure projects, but this is so unnecessary. It's just a vanity project for from George Osborne, mm -hmm. who wanted politicians love to say, "Here's my project. I got it done. Success story." What you've done is you spent a bunch of money on something that nobody really needs. Um, and at the beginning, they said it was going to be, what, 30 billion. Now it's looking it could be up to 80 to 100 billion. And it's such, a, it's really, really expensive. And by the time it's built, it's actually going to be quite outdated. So the main argument they're making is that it's, first they said it was about speed. So we need a train that gets from London to Birmingham 20 minutes quicker. That was the justification. And now they're saying it's about capacity. And now they're, now they're saying it's about jobs because they're creating lots of jobs because there's lots of PR firms being hired by HS2 to sell the project. <laughs> um, there's about 17 PR firms. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so that that is one area of spending that yeah. I, if I was prime minister, I would cut on day one mm. because that's a lot. That's a lot of money. I mean, if you compare it to education in England, that's 33 billion. The entire defence budget is about 38 billion. HS2. 60 to 100 billion that's it's so much money and for something that is very unpopular and it's actually ruining people's homes as well so that to put down the track they've got to build through a lot of towns and areas and it's causing a, a lot of upset and, and we're working really hard we hope that we can get it scrapped but at the moment they're saying we've spent four billion on it so far so we might as well waste another you know 50 60 billion which i think is a very poor argument um, and i would back any politician who had the guts to say we got it wrong I'm gonna I'm gonna save some money now. This is a, this is a bad project. Um, Quangos is another one. So there, do you know what a Quango is? It's a non-governmental organisation. Exactly. So it's uh, so the NHS is technically a Quango, I think, but it's essentially a publicly funded organisation that isn't really a government department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Public Health England um, is one of the most famous ones, um, but there are so many of them. There are so many of them that we don't even have a a list compiled, um, and they cost a lot of money, and uh, they have really expensive, really high salaries for bosses that come in. Sometimes ex-politicians or people that are friends of politicians, and then they get a cushy job at a quango, and they sit and write reports all day um, that nobody really reads. Um, so there is quangos for so many different things. A lot of them are, are health quangos. You could merge them into say twelve main health quangos and save so much money. Um, and David Cameron promised a bonfire of quangos when he when he mm. came in. So he said, "These are so you know we, we have too many. We've got hundreds of quangos. We don't need them. Let's just you know scrap a lot of them." And I think he cut down like a couple dozen, not even that. Um, but they don't really reach the headlines in the same way as. And why do you things. think that is? Why why were they not able to do that? What's what's the difficulty in getting rid of them or merging them? I just think it wasn't really a priority. There are so many things that. 
aren't a priority, like simplification of the tax system. Like simplifying the tax system would save so many problems, but it would take a long time, it would be very complicated, and at the moment I think there are politicians of other things in their mind. Um, but it's a shame because you know, there are so many things that could be improved by you know, either merging quangos, simplifying government, um, you know, getting rid of bureaucracy, but there just isn't the political willpower for it. Imagine like that's your political platform, like, okay everyone, <laughs> I'm just going to focus on just organising it, I'm going to give the government a spring clean um, and just make sure that every, everything's working well. That's, that's not as inspiring as saying, I'm going to spend all this money on, on this project or I'm going to fund this or fund that. But that's the vote winner, and mm -hmm. that's why I think Jeremy Corbyn is very popular. He's promising to, to do things, but those things all cost money. And the way that he wants to fund it is to actually kind of drain the wealth and the desire to create wealth in this country, um, which would be a very bad thing. Well done for getting that dig in there, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> very good. You mentioned the criticism that you, that you guys get, and you're, you're called right wing. I, I mean, first of all, I, I think Nazis. I imagine. Oh, quite often. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm pro fascist. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. According to some, a couple of people on the internet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there we go. Uh, and simultaneously, a left wing sell, selling out cuck as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, 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 what was it? Uh, social justice warrior, left wing cuck. Yeah. Wow. Who yeah. all, is also in favour of... Oh, and uh, third wave feminist as well. Uh, yeah, third wave feminist who's, who's pro-fascist and in favour of an uh, all-white ethno-state. <laughs> At the wow. same time, all at the same time. All at the same time. Uh, yeah. I am all things to all people. Yeah, yeah. We <laughs> cater to a broad audience here. Yeah. The internet is amazing. It yeah. is. It it's is. Truly it is. remarkable. Yeah, pointing out deficiencies that even I wasn't aware yeah. of. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, I mean, I think in this country, a lot of people use the word right wing as an insult and just to mean bad people. But there is a, a, a legitimate kind of right center right position that doesn't have to be demonized. So, when people talk about the Taxpayers Alliance being a right wing organization, is that accurate? Uh, I, I think so in, in that if right wing means less government, then mm. yes. Um, there, there are, you know, we, we stand, we're a very single issue group. We, Taxpayers Alliance doesn't have a position on Brexit or in many other things. It just stands for lower taxes, less government spending and more simpler government. You don't have a policy um, on the Jews, right? No. <laughs> no. Okay, then, then you're not that kind of right wing that we're talking about. Right. Yeah, I'm sure there's probably a government quango somewhere. There, there probably is. Probably Jerry is. Corbyn probably started one, let's be honest. As a quango for everything, yeah. for every season. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, under Jeremy Corbyn, there would definitely be a quango for Jews, I reckon. Yeah. 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 I, I think there's a lot of people who think that if you also campaign for lower taxes, it means you don't want to help people or you don't believe in any kind of public... Uh, service or, or government and that's just not true at all I think there are definitely libertarians out there who support us and who would like to privatize everything and I, I wonder who would build the roads to be honest yeah. um, but generally most of our activists and certainly the, the teams that we're with at the moment we just believe in smaller government so keep it to the essential stuff most people just want to pay their taxes but not too much um, for good public services and other than that for the government to leave them alone so it sounds like what you really want is just to eliminate waste from... Pretty the, much, yeah. 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 And, and also just make things run a lot more smoothly. Um, so it's great, at Conservative Party conference we had a panel on uh, local councils and someone put their hand up and said, um, I used to work in the private sector and now I, I went into a local council to do some work and it was like walking into a 1970s TARDIS. <laughs> it was incredible. And, and I think that's the reaction of a lot of people that go from the private to the public sector. They say, how, how are these processes in place? Why does everything take such a slow, why does everything move so slowly? Why is there no efficiency? Why is there no get up and go? Um, I think we really need that, especially you know with, with Brexit. Um, a spring cleaning of, of government. I think I'm going to use that actually. Um, yeah, I like that phrase. Government is like a spring, spring clean. clean. Yeah, yeah, make it efficient. One thing I always want to ask people who are involved in tax, and this is for the average person on the street, and it drives me up the wall, and I'm sure it drives them up the wall. Why can't we get big businesses to pay fucking tax? That's a very good question. It's because the UK has a really overcomplicated tax code. It's about 11,000 pages long. And there are so many different taxes and tax codes that if you're an accountant and you 
search hard enough, you can find a loophole for just about anything. So if you're a really big company or organization, you can afford a team of accountants and lawyers to find all the loopholes for you. That's how big companies like, like Amazon and, and Facebook and multinationals um, don't end up paying as much taxes as smaller organizations. It's completely legal. They find accountants and lawyers to find holes. If you simplify the system and you said, here it is, everyone's got to pay this, there are a few exemptions, um, but this is the, these are the rules, you wouldn't, they wouldn't be allowed to do that. And this is, it really annoys me when politicians say, oh, we need to crack down on businesses not paying their fair share. It's in their power. Like, these companies are avoiding tax completely legally. It's you, politician, that needs to change the law to make it fairer, because it's not fair that if you're a small business, you can't afford to get an accountant to find loopholes for you, so you pay your taxes in good faith, um, when a larger organization can afford to find a loophole. It's just, it's, it's really not fair. And it means there isn't trust in the tax system. And, and it means that people start resenting paying their taxes because like, why am I paying so much of my, my wage or my earnings or my, you know, my small profit to the state when all these larger companies aren't? Totally with you on that. So, so in a sense, why don't they change it? Is it going back to what you said that actually it's because it's too complex and it's too difficult and it doesn't grab, capture the public's imagination? Or is it a part of it, there's a more sinister reason? I don't want to think there's a sinister reason. I'd like to believe that it's just because it's not a priority. Um, but maybe, I don't know, I'm not privy to backroom conversations. I know that there is a big problem with corporatism at the moment in the West and that you do have companies with larger GDPs than countries, huge organizations. And once you get to a certain size, you almost don't want a free market. You don't want it to be easy for your competition to enter the market. Oh. So you do cozy up with the EU or, or you know, bureaucrats in, in Whitehall to try and get the rules written so there are more regulations and more barriers to entry. That would be in your interests. Um, and I think at the moment, people distrust business and capitalism because they see that happening. Um, and that's that's not right. That's not free. That's not a proper free market. That's corporatism, and that's not really what I stand for. And where do you stand on the tax rate? Because you've talked about eliminating waste, but you've also said that people pay too much tax. Mm -hmm. So, is your argument that we, if we eliminate you know, HS two, we eliminate quangos, or you know, cut down the number of quangos, we eliminate other things that you've talked about? Then, just by virtue of that, the tax rates can come down. Or is it really about reducing the tax load on people altogether in addition to those things so that we would have less money for other things, for public services and whatever? You'd have to do both and you'd have to do it gradually. So you'd want to lower taxes gradually mm -hmm. um, and also cut down on spending bit by bit. Um, I'm a you know big fan of the do it now a little bit and wait and see because I think if you did lower some taxes you'd find you get more revenue in. So when corporation tax was lowered um, the government had more more revenue because you know more people were, were paying it, there was more of an incentive to pay. Um, so I think if you did lower taxes you, you may find that there's more money in the economy and things grow more and you do have more revenue. Um, but like all economics, it really is disputed, and I'm not an economist by, by any standard, um, but we had some researchers um, on this to work out all of these problems in the single income tax, which I spoke about, which was you know, sitting down and seriously thinking, what would you need to cut? Um, what would you need, what would be a long-term plan to get to that optimum point of, of spending and taxation? Um, and it's a really, really good document, and I'd encourage anyone who's who is unsure about what we stand for to actually read that because they're very practical measures. And we actually had a thing on our website where you could go through and test how much you would cut. So a list of things mm -hmm. that of, of spending you could cut, so like state-funded art or foreign aid or you know, HS2, and it would show you how much spending decreased. So it showed you how much you could afford to cut taxes by or how much money you'd be saving. And that, that was very cool. Um, but I don't think it would be as simple as just you know, clicking your fingers, get rid of some waste and lower taxes. I think it would be difficult and have to be gradual, but it would it would make people's lives, living standards a lot better because I think when you put money in people's and businesses' hands, they spend it a lot better than the government. And actually, when you leave it to people to solve problems, they're pretty good at it. So you have the government failing in some areas, so the rollout of universal credits, and then the community food banks, a trust or trust, a charity set up by individuals in the community come in and solve that problem. And I think that's a really good thing. It's interesting. So you, you've, you've talked about some of the kind of, I mean, all, all the things you're saying, 
you may or may not agree with them, but they're reasonable things, right? These are conversations that can be had reasonably, right? I think this is what taxes should be. No, I disagree. I think this is what mm. taxes should be. I want to go to Birmingham 20 minutes faster. I don't. Do you? No, of course not. <laughs> I want to leave Birmingham 20 minutes faster. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, see, okay, we've lost all our Southampton and Birmingham <laughs> audience. To the, all five of them. All five of them. Um, so these are conversations that you can have as two reasonable people and have a reasonable disagreement about, right? So where does the vitriol come from that you've kind of referenced, that people push back on it, people call you Nazis and whatever? Mm. Why, why is that? Why do you think? That's a good question. I, I wish I knew because then maybe I could stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew why people were so negative towards us and as a spokesperson, a lot of it's just directed at me, so I'm used as a bit of a punching bag sometimes. Mm. Um, we have a lot of activists um, who are afraid of putting themselves out there for that reason. I think, I'm not sure if it's just a left problem, but at the moment, particularly online, there is a very strong um, you know, left-wing hate mob that descend on you if you publicly say things that I'm saying. Um, and even if you are perfectly reasonable in your arguments and you do try to explain yourself, I think there's a barrier to accepting that any reasonable person could not be a socialist. So as soon as you are to the right of Jeremy Corbyn, <laughs> um, it's assumed that you're an evil person. And what I've found is you're dehumanized. And so you don't, des they, I think they think you don't really deserve the respect or courtesy as a normal person, because if you're right wing, you're evil. So I don't need to engage in your arguments or your ideas because you're an evil person. And so it's okay for me to send you nasty messages and tell you to go back to where you came from and all that kind of rubbish. Um, I think as well, the internet has a big part to play in this. I don't know if they'd say this to my face. I don't know if people would say the things I say on Twitter to anyone's face. Mm. Um, so maybe, I mean, I try to, it, it is hurtful, but when I read them, I try to think, well, this person's probably just having a bad day <laughs> and, and I'm take, getting the brunt of it. And a, a bad year. Yeah. A bad life. More. Bad life and it can more, kind of yeah. be like a football team. Like I'm on this side and you're on that side. Mm. So it's going to feel good to have a go at you. It's kind of tribalism. And people on the right do it as well. Like I think a lot of left wing commentators and politicians get so much nastiness online. And it is very tribal because I have friends who are very left wing and they're really good people. And I think we just disagree yeah, on yeah, how to solve true. the world. It's true, there are exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> now, Francis himself probably more left, more left than anything. Yeah. Uh, and we, we don't take that kind of, we're, we're not right wing. I'm probably more centrist. Francis is probably slightly left. But w what troubles us is this tribalism uh, because it prevents genuine conversation. You know, that, that's the issue for us. So whether I agree with you or not, to me, is much less important than whether we actually have a genuine conversation uh, mm. and have that ability to exchange ideas and exchange information. I think that's much more important. And like you say, I think online, you know, like we, we actually did a whole video of all the comments that people send us. Yeah. Uh, whether they're just like straight up racist comments, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. And it is quite funny, you know, as comedians, we're used to dealing with it. So we don't take it personally, but I can totally see that if you're trying to do something, uh, you're trying to make change in society and whatever, and you just get hundreds of messages of people just being nasty to you, it, it, that's a different thing, you know? Mm. Uh, and it, it's, very, it's very unfortunate that that happens. And like you said, I think it happens on both sides. It's not a right or a left thing. Um, but it ties into another thing that we wanted to just have a chat about as well, which is the free speech thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is um, you know, you, you, you mentioned that you were concerned about free speech on campus and things like that. What, is, what did you want to uh, say on that issue? Yeah, I, I'm just really concerned that uh, fear of offence and fear of what people will say about you is stopping genuine, authentic conversation and expression. So I'm concerned that at particularly universities, young people are told that they've got to be you know, really careful about what they say or they'll get you no know, platformed or banned or it, I, I'm just, I'm concerned about that. I don't know what the solution is. Um, I don't know if, you know, this is something that is as prevalent as perhaps the media make it out to be. Um, maybe there's a bit of hype around it, but I really hope that um, in our education system, we can teach people to have authentic conversations. Like I was very blessed to go to a philosophy college where the whole point was that you discuss ideas and not, you know, identities or take sides or anything. And you were trained to be able to see 12 different sides of an argument. And I don't think there's enough of that now. 
Um, I think there's a demonization of the other. Um, I think there is a lot of good versus evil rhetoric going on where it's, you know, you've got to have your beliefs and you're good and the other person's evil. Um, although it's been a little while since I've been to university, so I'm not sure if that is the case. Um, I don't know if, if you have any views on that, but it's just something that I'm concerned about because I'm seeing all these stories about people being, you know, platformed or someone going to do a talk at a university about something very, um, you know, non-controversial, but then a bunch of protesters show up and it's shut down and I'm just, I'm concerned if that's the future, if these are the people that are going to go into the world of work next. Um, if, if that's a healthy way to have society. And I, I see it happening in politics as well, actually. Um, it's a lot of good versus evil, you know, the kind of debates on TV where you, ha you have six minutes to discuss an issue and you've got a righty and a lefty and someone's got to win and they both put out a video saying, I owned the other person. Yeah. And it's not about maybe we can have a discussion and learn something about each other or maybe the viewers can learn something new. It's I need to beat you because you're evil and I'm good. I think the worrying thing with, that I find is ultimately why I have a discussion is to listen to somebody's point of view and then go, oh yeah, I never thought about it like that. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. And then what it becomes is adversarial and ultimately it's just about a display of ego. Mm. And that's what you see a lot of the time, whether it's question time or anything else. And that's why, you know, like we said before, I think when we started this show, is that's why we set this up, well, where we set this up, because it... Once you get to that point, then it's not about the shared, the, the expression of ideas and it's not about sharing ideas and it's not about learning and it's just about, you know, the glorification of one's own ego. Mm -hmm. Then that's where we end up, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, you've been on Question Time, actually. How did you find that? I have. Oh, I was so nervous mm. the whole week. I, I was so scared. And then I called my mum on the train. I said, Mum, I don't know if I could do this. And she said, oh, yeah, you're from Queensland. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you've dealt with scorpions. <laughs> You'll exactly. Be fine. You've yeah. killed spiders. You can yeah. take this on. I mean, they're terrifying. The they are terrifying. You're in your country. I just couldn't handle them. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Mate, it anything, was okay. anything that involving the words your country in your, <laughs> in your accent. Your fucking country. <laughs> sounds racist. <laughs> I embrace that. <laughs> your your accent, your tattoo, the whole look yeah, just yeah, doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a carefully con cultivated image, mate. Yeah. It's yeah. great. It's working for you. Yeah, it's I great know. Great brand. Roll with it. <laughs> the racist yeah. brand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was scary. So, so you were you were nervous, uh, and your mum kind of gave you that talk. And then backstage, they have um, lots of snacks and, and drinks, but no one really touches it because you're all so nervous. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then I, I, you go through and you sit down, and it was strange. As soon as I sat down and looked at the audience, I felt a bit more calm, and I, I kind of nodded to myself and said okay, I'm just going to answer some questions now and didn't really notice the cameras. Um, and it was a, a huge rush and it was really exciting because it was a show I'd watched so much mm. and shouted at and said, oh, if only I was, you know, yeah, up there. Yeah. Um, it's harder than it looks though. So I, I, I didn't watch the whole thing back, but I remembered there was a question on Corbyn and I froze and I didn't say authentically what I really thought. I just thought of something on the spot and I wish I could go back and redo that bit. Oh. Um, but that's part of the show, I suppose. It's live and you've got to be really quick on your feet. Um, but it was a really good experience. Um, and yeah, you get all the people afterwards saying nasty things about you. But what was really exciting was um, people getting in touch and saying, oh, you made me think about this a little bit differently. Or, hi, I'm also a young person and I hadn't really thought about the fact that I'm getting taxed so much. You know, that sucks. I looked at my paycheck and there's a lot of it going to the government. Um, and that was why I wanted to go on. I wanted to change some minds or offer a bit of a, a new perspective. <laughs> And what do you think of Corbyn? Because you, you sort of alluded to it before <laughs> and you were saying you don't agree. Because, I mean, there's a, there's a very healthy chance that, I mean, they were talking they were going to have a, there was rumours of an election in November and, I mean, we could still have an election the next year or so. There's a chance he could be Prime Minister. Why do you think that would not be a good thing for this country? I think his ideas are wrong. I think they're really, <laughs> really wrong. <laughs> like, everyone talks about him personally and his I don't know him personally I don't know what his morals are for all I know he has very good intentions I'm not going to make any statements about his character yeah. but his ideas and his plans are very wrong and I think they'd cause a lot of misery actually for people here and it would be a very very bad thing for the country and in a, in a way that I don't think I can articulate uh, you know well enough I, I you know the 
the idea of, of central planning and, and centralised control and the state seizing control of everything, it's very, very dangerous. And it's not just dangerous because you're disempowering people of their liberty. Um, because you can say, well, yes, I lose my freedom and my ability to choose, but at least the services are running well. They don't run well. When things are run centrally from a, a government or from, it would be from Whitehall, um, you get shortages and things don't run very smoothly. And that's exactly what we saw in Venezuela. And I, I know that you know, that's kind of used as an example of socialism gone wrong and then socialists say, well, that's not real socialism. But every single time central planning has been tried and the state seizing control of, of industry has been tried, it's resulted in mass misery. And it, I think it comes from a place of compassion initially. You want to help people and it sounds so simple. We're just going to take all the stuff and make sure it's distributed fairly. But it really doesn't work because the people distributing them are just people. And you replace one hierarchy, so free markets and people making money and getting further up, with another hierarchy where it's a bureaucrat at the top. And there's always corruption and it's always a bad thing. And in the UK, there was a little bit of central planning in, in the 70s and it was getting, there's a very big state. And, and Margaret Thatcher came in and really, she taught, can I say the S-H-I-T word? Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah. Like <laughs> she, yeah. really, she really just shook it up and she said, no, we're, go we're going to, we're going to really change things. And what's interesting is when she did that, the people that opposed a lot of her free market reforms the most was the British aristocracy, because suddenly it was going to be a level playing field. Working class kids were going to start um, competing with them for jobs and they were going to have to up their game and and suddenly you know wealth was something that you didn't just get because you were born into the right family it was something you could earn and be a part of and I think what she did for this country was fantastic and I would hate to see all of that go to go to waste to, to go back in time to that, that bad failed experiment of central planning and socialism I think free free markets are the best thing to a, a meritocratic hierarchy that we have. And that's a very good thing for people. Um, and I'm not sure how far Corbyn and McDonald would go with what they really want to do, because we know there's a Labour manifesto, and they are hardcore socialists, but the manifesto was a bit less radical, right? I don't know if they would just implement that or if they would go all the way, but I know that they want to go all the way. And if they can get away with it, they will. I think that would be a really bad thing. Um, I think a lot of the criticism about Corbyn is completely is a bit misguided because it's kind of like Trump. Like there were all these stories about his character, and um, you know Hillary Clinton said you know, he's a terrible man. People didn't care; they just wanted change. And I think the conservatives, you know, attacking Corbyn at the moment, they're all focusing on you know this thing he did or that thing he did, and it's it, people switch off to that because. All they know is, whatever, he could be a terrible person, but he's promising change. And at the moment, I don't think the Conservative Party are promising so real so solutions to people's problems right now. I think they're offering more of the same. And I think that the free market solution is better, but it's not being advocated very well right now. And that's why this, the kind of left-wing socialist ideas are coming back into fashion. It's funny, when you said uh, Jeremy Corbyn is like Trump, I thought we had an exclusive <laughs> yeah. on our hands. I thought you were going to tell us something completely different. My, I was going viral clip, viral yeah, yeah, clip. No, yeah. nothing like that. Uh, no, but actually your, your point I think is exactly right, which is that whatever someone's ideas, in the absence of a compelling competing narrative, change will always trump the status quo if people are not happy with the status quo. And that, I think that explains. And what I really liked about what you said there as well is that whether you like Jeremy Corbyn or not, you, uh, you're quite happy to go, well, I don't know him, he might be a really nice guy, but I don't agree with his ideas. And so much of our politics now seems to be about attacking the person, attacking yeah. the man. Uh, we've seen this with uh, you know, this uh, judicial appointment in America with uh, Brett Kavanaugh. It's been all about, like his judicial record pretty much didn't get talked about at all. And it's all about certain allegations, which may or may not be true. It's the same with Donald Trump. You know, we, we, when we think about Donald Trump, we don't think about policy. I think most people would struggle to name a single policy other than build a wall. Tax cuts. Yeah. Tax cuts. Yeah. <laughs> that was more Paul that, That's your thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's your yeah. thing. So it's all about personalities now. It is. Um, and I think that that's not a good thing. Uh, no, it, I understand why people want to vote for people that they like. Mm. So I don't have anything against politicians being charismatic or likable or like fun. Like Jeremy Corbyn. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think he's that charismatic, actually. I was being sarcastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know who is charismatic? Jeffrey Cox. Did you see the speech he made at conference? No. It was, it was brilliant. It was so entertaining. He, he, the Attorney General, no one knew who he was, and he got up and did this rousing speech in, like, a Mufasa voice. <laughs> and he said, you know, we need not fear self-government. <laughs> and it was amazing. Anyway, uh, we're getting sidetracked. Yeah. Um, but... I think the issue in politics now is that people are basing their political beliefs on identities. So I identify as this kind of person, oh. therefore I've got to vote this way. And it's less about the manifestos and the policies, it's it's more about personality and identity. Um, I think that gets in the way of, of proper discussion. So even though maybe if people didn't know, um, you know the organisation that I work for, for example, oh. And they heard me speak an argument and I said, um, you know, we should change this policy. Maybe they'd listen more than if I was introduced as this is Chloe from a right wing think tank. Yeah. Because I think as soon as you do that, certain amount of people just switch off and yeah. go, oh, she's evil. Um, and I'm, I'm a goodie because I love the state. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's too much for that. I was actually going to ask you in terms of identity. You're a, a, a conservative woman. I hope I haven't misgendered you there. So. <laughs> you haven't misgendered yeah, me, yeah, no. Perfect. Uh, so uh, what's that like? Oh, good question. Um, I'm not a member of the Conservative Party. Um, but I'm but in the small closest, C Conservative. Yeah, they're closest to my to my views. I think I'm more of a, a liberal, but not in the um, the left wing sense. I'm more of a libertarian, classical, classical liberal. liberal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't think anyone is just one thing. Um, but yeah, I am. I'm a right wing you know, conservative woman. Um, it's difficult because you kind of don't really always get the approval of your side, be, your side, because sometimes I speak about, you know, inequality or, you know, unconscious bias and it's difficult sometimes in certain industries being a woman or there's discrimination. And then I'm said, oh, you know, get over it. And But then I don't get the defense of the feminist because I'm right wing, so I'm not really a person. So mm-hmm. when people are sending me very sexist comments, um, you know, there's there's very little outrage or sympathy because like, all she deserves it because she's evil because she wants to lower taxes. Um, so <laughs> it's it's all, it's all right. I don't think it dominates um, my career though. The fact that I am a conservative woman or, or that I'm a woman. Mm. Most of my days spent talking about taxes, which is not gendered. Right. <laughs> Taxpayers, <laughs> both men and women pay taxes. Yeah. So. So I'm curious, you mentioned about uh, kind of annoying your side. Uh, yeah, I don't like to call it that, Yeah. but yeah. Well, I know what you mean. Yeah. People who would otherwise be aligned with what you're saying, Yes. they get annoyed by you talking about inequality. Or So what is it that you that where you differ from the kind of mainstream narrative on that side of things in terms of when you talk about women's issues or whatever? Mm-hmm. What is it that you say that annoys them? Yeah, I'm not sure if it annoys them, but I'm definitely definitely honest about what I think about things and predominantly on, on Twitter I'll say what I really think yeah. and sometimes people think it's a bit strange so you know I'll talk about why you know it's it's not fair that sometimes women in politics are judged unfairly for how they look or how they dress and um, I'll be told to you know grow up by um, some people and told well you'd stop complaining um, you're a right wing woman so you support the patriarchy and so I can't really have an opinion on, on social issues without people bringing my economic beliefs into it, if that makes sense. Um, And I'd say that uh, I'm probably aligned with a lot of young people on most issues. Um, I'm, you know, pretty libertarian. I think I'm coming around to drug legalization. Um, I think gay marriage is a great thing. Um, You know, I'm I'm pro-choice. And these are a lot of issues that I think it's lots of young people uh, agree with me, but because I think taxes should be lower, there's a perception that I'm supposed to be really conservative on social issues too. Mm. So, so but one play, one way you differ from a lot of young people statistically is Brexit. Yeah. And that you are pro Brexit, you believe it's a good idea. Um, I think I'm um, statistically a mo- majority of young people are anti Brexit. Can you just explain in a nutshell why you think it will be a positive thing for this country? I think it'd be a great thing. I, st- I still really, really do. Um, at the moment, a lot of the conversations are about how we leave um, and the technicalities of the deal. But the reason people voted leave was what could be achieved outside of the EU. And it was really about who makes decisions in this country. Is it going to be 
the EU that makes decisions about policy or elected politicians in the UK. And that is essentially what it came down to, whether you're left or right wing. The decisions have been made in Westminster now. And so you, you have more power and more influence over decision making than when those decisions were made um, in the European Commission. Um, so I think it'd be a, a fantastic thing. Um, but I appreciate not all young people agree with me. What's interesting though is when you break it down by social class, um, uh, working class young people, about 45% voted leave. So in the referendum, yes, age was a big determining factor, but also geography um, and income was also was another big factor. Wealthier people voted remain. Um, less well off people tended to, to vote leave more. Um, it's actually, but we had a guest on the show who, whose episode may or may not release before or after yours. Eric Kaufman is a professor of politics at Ber Birkbeck University and he's just, he's just publishing a book now where he talks about his analysis of, at the individual level of the reasons that people vote for Brexit. And actually he shows that income was not a big factor. Uh, and the biggest factor was attitudes to immigration, essentially. Uh, and he's not, by the way, using that narrative that everyone who voted leave is a racist at, at all. But that was the biggest predictor of voting to leave. So I think the elite, the kind of the intellectual elites might have been concerned about getting our uh, powers back from Brussels or whatever. But actually, I, I think this is what I was going to put to you. Mm -hmm. the, the main predictor of voting to leave was social attitudes, particularly to immigration. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, what do you make of that counter-argument? Mm, that's really interesting. Um, well, I can only go based on anecdotal evidence and people that I spoke to oh. on the campaign. Um, and it was more of a gut instinct that decisions should be made here. That mm. now I want my government to be in control of that, whether it's immigration or trade or whatever. Um, but I know that immigration played a really huge part in that. Um, what was interesting is after the referendum, Open Europe did a really big extensive report into attitudes and immigration in the UK, um, what people really think. And what they found was that most people just wanted immigration to be controlled and fair, um, and they didn't really have a problem. It wasn't about numbers, it was more about the fact that Britain didn't have control over immigration. That was a really big concern. And what's interesting is that um, the most popular replacement immigration system is the Australian skills-based system that we have in Australia. Um, and we have higher levels of immigration per capita, but it isn't, immigration isn't really um, an election issue. It's not as much of a political issue because people have trust in the system. The government controls it and we know it's fair. Um, and I think if you had that system in the UK where people knew, okay, well, the government's regulating this and you know, it's, it's based on, on visas and, and, and work and it's not based on whether someone's European or not, I think there'd be a lot more positive uh, towards immigration. I also think infrastructure is a huge problem. So housing, um, people became, uh, I think they felt like Britain was becoming not too full, but public services were getting very busy and there's enough houses. Um, and what's interesting, this has been pointed out to me by free market people who are very pro-free movement, and they say to me, well, the market is able to respond to changes in population. So Tesco always has enough food for people, um, private services always do. It's the public services, the government services that don't really keep up with yeah. changes to population. Um, so, you know, free movement isn't a bad thing, Chloe. It's just that the government hasn't been able to, you know, get the NHS to, to speed up and creating more you know, hospitals and, and infrastructure and the like. Um, and I think that's probably the case, but just because, just because there is, in a perfect world, a free market way of having free movement, I don't think that's an argument for it to happen now because we live in the real world in the UK where actually infrastructure isn't keeping up with demand. We don't have a government that is keeping up with demand and, and people are really struggling and, and suffering now under the, the weight of, of, of that. Um, but what, what was interesting during the referendum is that I was an immigrant campaigning for Brexit and a lot of people found that very interesting. Um, and I think, yeah, I moved here, I want to live here permanently, this is my country, and for me it was a lot more about the future of Britain than immigration policy. But I personally found it very unfair that people from non-EU countries were discriminated against in favour of those from EU countries. So you had an open door policy with some 
people based on where they're born and a closed policy on others based on where they're born. I think it's actually very discriminatory and xenophobic um, and it's it's not the best way to, to have an immigration system. But uh, why do people vote leave? I mean, that is the, the question that uh, that everyone asks and it's a million dollar question. And I'd be interested in reading that report. Oh yeah, it's but, a book, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll give you yeah, the details. You, but, I think and I know immigration was a, was, a, was a big thing, but it wasn't the only thing. And what I found anecdotally and, you know, after the referendum speaking to a lot of leave activists, it was just about control. It was just about, I want the British government to be in control of these things. These are things that should be done by a national government, not a multinational organisation that I have no access or, or power to, to lobby or, or change things. All right. Well, uh, listen, our time's almost up. It's been so great to have you on. Thanks for coming to talk to us. No uh, the question we always like to ask at the end is, what is the one thing that we're not talking about that we ought to be talking about? Ooh. Automation. I think, yeah, I, it's, it's shocking. I, I think automation is going to change society. It's going to change the world. It's going to change how we live our lives. And it's going to, if we don't plan for it, it, I mean, it could be a really, really good thing, but it's going to completely change everything. Automated cars, automated, you know, jobs becoming automated. And we should be talking about and planning for that now. Excellent. All right, listen, thanks very much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to have you on the show. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed it this week, uh, click that bell button next to the subscribe button, once you've clicked the subscribe button, of course. Uh, subscribe to us on U iTunes and SoundCloud. Uh, follow us, uh, Francis, at Trigger. Uh, Trigger Pod. Yep. Uh, follow us on uh, Instagram, Twitter. Go on our Facebook. Leave a nice comment. Insult Constantine. Do whatever you want to do. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for watching, listening, whatever else. And we'll see you next week.